treated as it's nothing. But between 0.3 and 0.5, maybe it's something, right? Test, check, don't just use the rule of thumb, evaluate. What are the steps in a exploratory factor analysis? The first step is, why are you doing EFA? Don't you already know what you were doing when you created this data set? Right? If you knew, oh, these items were designed for this, and these items are designed for that, then why are you doing EFA? You already have a mental model. <coughs> Don't do EFA. Don't throw things in the air and see where they land. Test your theory first, which is what tomorrow will be about, confirmatory factor analysis. So, I really... In a perfect world, we would do CFA first, but you need to know about EFA to see how it's different to CFA. So the first thing is, wait a minute, you designed a data collection instrument. You had an idea that these items have something in common and these items have something else in common. That's the first thing you should test. Test your model. You might discover that it's okay. So if a reviewer says, but why did you do CF why didn't you do EFA? Because you're a dumbass and you don't understand that I already have a theoretical model, so I'm going to test it. If you find that your model doesn't work, then then you have to do EFA. Okay? So if you put your model in and go, oh I was wrong. Nothing that I plan works, then maybe I should do EFA. Yeah, but uh, what does it mean if uh, uh, your model for CFA doesn't work? So your theory is not valid, and that's why you're trying to build another theory according to your data set? Yes, or because that's what EFA is. EFA is simply exploiting the artifacts in your data set. You're absolutely right. If you cannot make your theoretical model work, by, oh, well, I'll cut it here and I'll change it here and I'll do this, you know. If you can't make your theoretical model work, then you've, all you've got left is a data set that you have to throw in the air and see how it lands. All right? Exactly. You're exploit, you're doing data mining instead of theoretical, conceptual analysis of data. I cannot stress that enough. So this is what, I'm going to go through this. Because you need to know how to do it in case what I thought was the answer is not the answer according to the people from whom I got the data. Remember, you're an expert. The people you are collecting data from, parents, teachers, students, they don't think like you do. By definition. They haven't got, they are not working on PhDs, they don't have PhDs, they haven't studied this area, you have. So you're an expert compared to them. And experts' theories don't always work in reality. So, sample size is a real nightmare. Sometimes it's hard to get a lot of people, especially if it's a, uh, I think these things belong together, but I'm really not sure kind of stage, you know, in a very early stage in a development. So, how many people do you need? Well, it depends. Herb Marsh has shown that if you only had 50 people, you would need 12 items for every factor to have a hope of capturing that factor. And he recommends that 100 people, you need 8 items for each factor. At 200 people, you can get away with six items. At 500, three, three, people, three items per factor. Okay? So that's one recommendation. How big is your sample? How many items do you need for each factor? We want factors of five or six items because that's efficient for collecting data on lots of things. But if you only had a pilot study of 100 people and you wrote five items for the factor, you're unlikely to find that that factor exists. You might find that two factors become one factor simply because you don't have enough power to identify that factor. Okay. Sorry. 
that, well, this is another way of thinking about the rule of thumb. Multivariate statistics people will say, in a perfect world, you have 10 people for every variable in your, in your study. At 50 people and 12 items, you, you're down to four cases, four people for every variable, which is eh, marginal. Power matters here, even in exploratory factor analysis. So if you're thinking, oh, well, I'll do an, I'll, I'm trying to write a new questionnaire, a new instrument, a new test, so I just need to pilot it with a bunch of people. All right, I grab 50 people, but I have 48 items. Well, you're only probably going to find four factors. If you design eight factors, six items, six eights, or 48, if you design six items, you're probably not going to find six factors because you don't have enough power to separate the factors. What else helps is this, the strength of the loadings. If the loadings are 0 0.4, 0 0.5, you need a lot more people if the loadings are all 0 0.8, 0 0.7, then you can go get away with fewer people, right? So, how many people you have is influenced by how many items you have and how strong the loadings are. Now, if it's a newly developed instrument, you don't know how strong the loadings are yet. So, you have to think about, well, at least, if I only have 50 people, I have to think about, like, do I have enough items to capture this construct? All right? So it's not just a question of, oh, I've got 10, pe 10 people for every variable. You might not be able to get 120 or 240 or 500 people at a pilot stage. Right? So think carefully. Oh, this article here, Costello and Osborne, this journal is an excellent journal. It's completely open access. It is an amazingly good journal. They, reviewers are excellent. They're blind reviews. There's no payment. It's fully online, and it's a great resource. Generally, if you're going to publish something in factor analysis, more is better. What factor analysis people find is that even when you have 400 people, the model will fail to solve around 2% of the time. Okay? So just by chance processes, 2% of the time you'll get an inadmissible mod, uh, result. So power really matters. Uh, how do we know we can factor this? Well, the intercorrelations among the variables are better than 0.3. The matrix diagonals are 0.5. Kaiser Meyer Oken is greater than 0.6. And Bartlett's test of sphericity. Don't report this stuff. For goodness sake. Don't put it in your article or your technical report or your people will go, who cares? Not interested. You need to check it. Yeah met conventional standards for proceeding with factor analysis is all you need to say and you can give as a reference oh no not there uh bandalos and finney a reference yes I'll, I'll get you the reference before the end of the day extraction methods do not do pca even though it's the first one in the choice in spss and if you choose factor analysis in jabon v you don't get a choice of pca because PCA is a separate procedure. Maximum likelihood with continuous variables is the gold standard. And principal axis factoring is the backup when the ML didn't work, usually when you have small n. How small? How small? Well, 100 ish. If you only have 100 people, you probably want to use, or if your case to variable ratio was pretty low, you only had three people for every variable, maybe TAF will work. Mm -hmm. um, can, can, um, 
in like ordinal variables, like on the on the Likert scale, with for example six, um, six to eight yes. girls, we can see that it's continuous. I'll get there. So we can just leave this guy, this line. Mm -hmm. Obviously, ordinal. Yes, no, right, wrong, male, female kinds of things are binary, and you use the ADF, this asymptotic distribution free estimator, and I will show you where that is in Levant. If you have up to four categories, you either use the principal axis or the weighted least squares, means, and variance estimator. Fortunately, WLSMV is in Levant, so you don't have to buy 895 US dollars M plus to get it. If it's continuous, you use the maximum likelihood. If you have five or more categories in an ordinal scale, the research says it's almost the same as continuous, just use continuous. And there's a chapter I use for that all the time. Just go, Whoop. These people say it's almost the same. Oh, well. So five, five options uh, like this. Five yeah. ordinal yeah. options is kind of sufficiently similar. like Continu con continuous. In Lisrael, if it's 15 categories, it automatically switches to maximum likelihood. <laughs> it's like, oh, come on, you must be kidding. 15 categories? Let's just call that continuous, right? Remember, remember the theory in this is this. Okay, so you've got there's your continuous ruler. Let me turn it this way a little. Here's your continuous ruler. What we're saying in an ordinal category, we've got we've chosen this one, we've made that nice and big. And we've chosen this one, it's nice and big. And we've chosen this one, it's nice and big. We've chosen this one. And what we're doing is we're identifying stopping points on a continuous scale. So the argument for the Likert type rating scale is that inherently underneath it is a continuous variable. And you estimate that best if you use at least five and preferably six or more stopping points. And don't use five because then people will think the middle one is a midpoint. And I don't know if midpoint means I don't know, I don't care, I don't understand. So force them to a choice. Three negative, three positive, fine. Two negative, four positive, fine. Never a gap in the middle where they can go, ah, I don't know, I don't care, I don't understand, you know? Don't do that. Right. Principle that factor analysis, path. The two frequently used methods, which we've already seen, and it gives you high values when at least some of the other manifest variables, which is essentially what's required. You get a big number if the other variables in the factor are correlated. And, what, and then what it does is it runs a principal components analysis underneath on these communalities. So it's factor analysis with a bit of PCA hiding underneath the hood. All right? So it's like it's not a Chevrolet engine, it's a Ford engine. It's a PCA engine using the communalities to estimate the communalities and it keeps going until it converges. So it's a kind of compromise backup but try maximum likelihood first if you can. Maximum likelihood. We're trying to find a fitting function that uses this set of matrices and formulas to get at. So the likelihood function of a particular values for the data. Lambda is the correlation matrix and t with the T is the transposition. So you, you, when you have a matrix like this, it's square, you transpose it. You've done that when you uh, take a, mat a set of values and you want to spin it the other way. So instead of having all the variables this way and cases this way, you transpose it, doing left to right. So you multiply it by its transposition, and then you add the psi values, those diagonal values, 
plus the trace of the covariance matrix, and you multiply it, in the, and it's absolute value. Guess what? You, if you see that again, you know, oh, that's the maximum likelihood formula. That's all you need to know. Okay? <laughs> what it, how I understand maximum likelihood is this way. We're trying to maximize the representation of the population. I've got a sample. I do not have everybody in the population. I do not have every student in grade six in my country. Right? I only have a sample of grade six students. If my sample looks like the population, then the best way to estimate the population values is to use the sample values. So what we're trying to do is maximize the likelihood that the sample parameters are the same as the population. <coughs> we're trying to say, if my sample looks like the population, then my sample values are the best estimate of the population values until I get more data to correct my estimates. So uh, ML uh, assumes a sample as population, kind of? Yes, because it's what else are you going to do? Your sample is your best estimate yeah. of the population. So it really matters that you get a good sample, both in size and representativeness. Now, in a test agency where everybody in the country takes the test, you don't have to worry about it because your sample is probably the population. But for the rest of us who have to do research in schools, and yes, you, you, this school said yes, and great, I got access. This school's students do not necessarily represent all of the population. And so that sampling techniques and sampling methods and ways of describing and estimating your sample are really a whole nother course. Uh, one of the things I tend to do is I try to describe my sample relative to important demographics of the population. If there's an article that we did in Contemporary Ed Psych. <clears throat> we had a class of about 395 students. They all had to do the assignment, but they had the power to say yes or no if we could use their data for research. So, voluntary informed participation. <sighs> what a nightmare. Out of the 395, only 166 said, yes, you can use my data, and here's all of it. And what we found is that there were more girls in the yes group than in the whole class, and the students had higher GPEs, or GPAs, than the people who said no. So we knew right from the beginning that our sample did not represent even the class that they were taken out of on those two variables. In terms of other variables, they were identical. So that's a caveat. The reviewers, examiners should always ask you, how does your sample compare to the population? And if you can't find population statistics, then you better have a lot of people in your sample. But most government statistics will tell you 68% of teachers in this country are women. And you go, oh, I got 73% women. Okay, 73, 68, probably within chance. Work out a chi-square. But if you turned out you got 99% women in your sample, then maybe you are not really representing the population. And yes, you're going to use maximum likelihood, but your sample does not really truly describe the population. And it tells you, let's go find some more men to be in this survey before I do the analysis. Right? That's what it tells you. And more data is always better anyway. 
Maximum likelihood, if the data are relatively normal, because it allows for the computation of a wide range of indexes of goodness of fit. This is the beauty of maximum likelihood, is it gives you fit quality. How close is this to the covariance matrix that I started with? Not how close is it to the population, you don't know about the population, but here's your model, does it fit the data? Maximum likelihood gives you the ability to evaluate that. If multivariate normality is severely violated, and that's a question of how bad is bad. Uh, kurtosis 3, normal. Kurtosis 7, probably no problem. Kurtosis 11, I've seen studies where they've said up to 11, yeah, okay. Maximum <laughs> likelihood is okay. Though not everyone believes that. Right? But I can find an article that says 11 is okay. 23, probably not. You probably need to fix it. Or if you can't fix it, you better use PAF. All right? So really abnormal or really small, PAF is your backup. Otherwise, use maximum likelihood. These guys conclude ML or PAF give the best results. So, notice PCA is not on the list here. It doesn't belong. But, just to show you, here's the six items from the classroom environment scale. I did an SPSS. Here's what SPSS look, uh, PCA looks like, and here's what MLE looks like. Notice in PCA, the initial communal, initial value is always one, because it's 100%. There's no residual, there's no attempt at partition, whereas in maximum likelihood there is, it's much less, because it's going, well, these items don't share very much. But notice the communality values are not hugely different. 59, 50, okay, 0.09 different. 66, 59, 71, 67, 51, 40, 71, 67, 61, 52. They're not identical, not a big difference. So what you'll find is if you do PCA, you'll end up with results that are not hugely different to ML, but it's not the right logic. So, level of measurement, you understand about Interval, ratio, ordinal, and nominal. For factor analysis, everything has to be interval, or ratio, and ordinal. And in Jamovi, they use this nice little ruler icon to show that it's a ratio scale. And they use this little step histograms to show that it's Likert scale. Factor analysis will work only if your variables have these icons in the data set. Different estimators in Jamovi. Jamovi will give you PCA, PAF, and MLE. And when you look at the results, you get this nice step. There's a crossover. Nice step. This is the PE items and the CE items. And the results look almost the same. And the very max, uh, the PCA said, oh, there's only one factor. And you go, wait a minute, I tried to create two factors. What do you mean you're only giving me one? Over here, I'm getting three, but, well, you know, three's closer to two than, you know, like, wait a minute, maybe if I took away this, why do these ones, you know? So there's, and then you look at the correlation matrix and what you find the estimates, notice here's the first three eigenvalues, 76% versus 63% versus 64%, 65%. So the PCA is overestimating how much variance is explaining. Whereas the two factor analysis are a little more conservative. They're not, they're not claiming to explain everything. Uh, we think this is what it's about. So it's, I suppose it's one of the rules of thumb that I have in my head is um, not claiming too much. 
being cautious and conservative. What am I really claiming here? Am I claiming to explain 76% of the variance or more like two-thirds? Yeah, let's, let's be a little cautious here. Let's not claim cold fusion when we don't have it. Right. Factor loadings. Yes, of course. Um, here is um, explaining variance, um, 64%. And does it, um, does it mean that it's okay because we still have so much of unexplained things? Does it mean it's okay? <laughs> you can't tell with this data. You have to use confirmatory factor analysis to get at, is it good enough? Is it true? Is it right? This is not what I intended. I intended for two factors. These two to be over here, these two to be here, and there's no third factor, is what I intended. Designed it to be CE and PE. Correlated, like it shows down here, they're correlated, but I really, well, no, three factors. Mm, damn, that's not what I wanted. I was aiming for two. But EFA doesn't know what I was trying to achieve. I'd have to go in and tell it, solve for two factors, not give me however many you think there are, right? So you can't tell from that. So there's two kinds of relations between the factor and the variable. One is a correlation. How much does this item correlate with the uh, factor? And SVSS calls that the structure matrix. The pattern matrix is the regression. This factor explains this much variability in the item. Now that's the one I prefer to use because we're trying to use a regression modeling mentality that the latent trait explains the variation in the behavior of the variable as well as some random residual stuff that I can't explain. My theoretical model is classical test theory that the latent factor explains the responses and that that's a causal relationship. So I use a, prefer the regression because that's what I'm going to do later on when I come to path analysis and structural equation modeling. So why not begin the way I plan to end? Start with the regression. The squared factor loading is the percentage of the variable that is explained by a factor. So 0.73 times 0.73 is somewhere around 52. That's, it's that simple. R squared, the loading squared. One minus the squared multiple correlate. So it's the square value, not the actual value. So, I'm going to read my pen. Oh, there it is. So, what we have here is if lambda equals 0.60, hey, we we're pretty happy. How much is the error? The error is equal to 0.60 squared taken away from 1, because 1 is 100%. So that's 36. So 1 minus 36 is 64. So 64% of the variance is not explained. Oh, I have a lambda of 60. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's only 36% of the variance. And 64% of the variance is in the space I don't know what's causing this and I don't understand it and it's not in my model and I can't explain it. It's the universe of weird shit that happens. Right? you got to be honest with yourself about, hey, I'm explaining a lot of variance. Well, at 0.90, yeah. 0.80, you're over half, two-thirds. 0.70, you're only at halfway. Right? Don't oversell your result. You know? And frankly, if you have a, a model that says, I can explain, I can use how rich mommy and daddy are to explain how well kids do on a test, do you expect it to be more than 25 or 30% of the variance? Do you really honestly think that one factor can explain that 100%? There's the individual kid, his motivation, his attention, his efforts. There's how de mommy and daddy might be rich, but they might not pay any attention to their kitty. There are rich people who ignore kids, right? 
and this kid may hate his mommy and daddy anyway, and so he's going to get revenge by doing badly at school. And so you really think one factor can explain a lot of variants? Come on. This is the real world. So, rotation. I showed you in the early picture of my vectors are going to explain my va vari variables and the pattern of those variables, but often we need to move perspective. We need to move. So when you go into an art gallery and you're looking at this giant thing, if you move over here, you see it in a new light. And that transformation of your per viewing